So I work across different fields as an artist, composer and performer. And at the heart of my practice, I work with the voice to create immersive spaces, attempting to unearth an essential relationship with the law of places. And by law, I mean the L-O-R-E, meaning of the word. Um, I sometimes describe my process as revealing mnemonic topographies, the land encoded in the song, that's a spelling mistake there, <laughs> the law embedded in the land. And in the context of today, I will focus on a single project, Away with the Birds, or Air Fall of Lechnichion in Gaelic. I'll only be able to skim the surface in the short time, but hopefully it will give you a wee taste. So, Away with the Birds is a cross art form project exploring the mimesis, or the imitation or emulation of birds in Scottish Gaelic song. And it was made in collaboration with a large team of people, including ornithologists, a wildlife sound recordist, song tradition bearers, sound archives, poets, costume designer, filmmaker, photographer, sound designer, and of course, vocalists. Um, this photograph is by photographer Alex Boyd, and it was the talisman image for the project. And the idea for the work grew out of an interest in music from around the world and noticing that in cultures where people have an intimate connection with the land, they're also good mimics of the sounds around them, and their music seems to grow directly from this relationship. I believe our music and even our language originated and evolved from our listening to the sounds of the animate landscape, or what eco-philosopher David Abram calls the more than human world. So, I began a journey looking for this kind of sound making practice closer to home. And in the English tradition, I found two songs, only two songs, that are mimetic in this way, both of birds. And I'll quickly sing a tiny extract from a piece that I wrote for solo voice, um, weaving together two songs, the blackbird and the cuckoo. Blackbird, black. But the cuckoo, will you come, will you come? So pretty bird, she sings as she flies. Golden beak, she brings us. Golden beak, good tidings, cold or black, cold or black, and tells us no lies. Weary waiting, she sucks the little bird's egg. Weary waiting to keep her voice clear. Blackbird, blackbird, and when she sings cuckoo, blackbird, the summer come quickly draws near. Okay, <laughs> so when I began investigating the Gaelic music of Scotland, I discovered a wellspring of tradition, preserved mainly in the Western Isles. And these songs and poems imitate the sounds and evoke the movements of various species of birds, mainly water birds, like these oyster catchers here, which is indicative of the Western Isles landscape. There are songs of seabirds that nest on the cliffs, kittiwakes, guillemots, manx shearwater, leeches, storm petrel, that song's really good, by the way, wildfowl such as whooper swans and geese, waders such as oyster catchers and red shanks, and poems of corvids and cuckoo. Some are directly imitative of the sound, where others are more stylized. 
So I'll go into detail about one song and its bird. This is The Red Shank. And I'll play a recording of Callum Johnson from the Isle of Barra in the 1930s singing a song called Pili Liu, a keening song, said to imitate the sound of the red shank. Pili Liu, 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 so when we listen to the actual bird in a recording by Jeff Sample, we can hear the way the intervals of the bird sounds ghost through the human melody. But as well as looking at sound, we can also glimpse into the cultural significance and symbolism of a particular bird and the function or context of the human song. So Gallic keening songs are vocal laments in honour of the deceased. With roots in pre-Christian ritual, they were once sung by professional keening women at funerals to carry the departed safely over to the next world. And red is associated with the other world in Celtic belief systems. And when we look at the red shank's eye-catching red legs, wading in the liminal space between sea and land, and listen to its haunting call echoing across the water, it's easy to understand why this bird might have been perceived as an agent of the other world, a kind of avian intermediary between the living and the dead. From a collection of nine songs and a handful of poems, I created a vocal score for 10 female performers. So I began this process by working with the Gaelic singer and tradition bearer, Mary Smith from Lewis, and wildlife sound recordist, Jeff Sample, to understand the relationship between the sounds in the songs and the sounds of particular birds. And then I began to deconstruct the songs into fragments, and I wove these together to create five different movements, each one a different habitat. So these are the different habitats in these five bands. And in the following drawings, I illustrate these habitats with birds that appear in the score. So this is movement one by the shoreline. And the scene begins at the shore with red-throated diver, oyster catcher, kittiwake, red shank, all in a Manxia water as well. Movement two on the cliffs. So this is about the social hubbub of colonies of seabirds. Movement three, ebb tide, lament. And this is predominantly the waders chorus at dusk with some corvids and a buzzard. Flock and skein, movement four. This, this movement looks at flight formation of gulls and wildfowl. Movement five, night flight to the burrow. And here are the Manx Shearwater returning to the cliffs of St Kilda. But as much as we sing the sound and movement of birds, we also sing the sound of the land, the wind, the weather, and especially the waves. And between each movement, Jeff Sample created an interlude that brings into the focus some of the sonic connections between the vocal composition and the actual birds. The score became a site-specific outdoor performance on the Isle of Canna, one of the small isles in the Hebrides, at the shoreline of the harbour with a sound system in the water. You can just about make out some speakers there in the water. So the voices drifted across to the audience. And we constructed a platform in the water, which during the performance gets submerged by the tide. And it was in a skein shape there. At that point, we were whooper swans. And the costume was designed with artist Deirdre Nelson, um, and it adopted colours and forms from the birds in the score. You can see um, this skein formation again in this knit. And of course the red legs. So Kana, as the host for the performance, was significant in a number of ways. I was keen to take the audience on a journey to the places that inspired the songs in the first place to their origins, 
And this island, only about one mile wide and four miles long, is a nature reserve with a diverse community of bird life, including rare species such as Manx shearwater, although there's only two pairs because of rats and then rabbits. At one stage, this island sustained 400 people, and now under 20 people live there. And in the 1930s, it became home to the folklorist John Long Campbell and Margaret Fay Shaw, who travelled the Western Isles collecting songs and stories, and their archive is now housed there. So the place of performance is very significant, as it entwines the two main threads together, the birds and the song tradition. And this map was made in collaboration with one of the residents there, Winnie McKinnon, Canna's last living tradition bearer. And it's a Gallic place names map, so it's the vernacular. And there's a wee still from a film of the audience with some of the performers behind. And behind that bush there is Canna House. Last year, the project was transformed for an online space commissioned by digital arts company, the Space Arts. And here you can navigate through this visual score to explore the research in audio essays, drawings, field recordings of birds, archive recordings of songs, film of the performance on Kana, and audio extracts of the composition. And hopefully the spelling is right in this one. <laughs> Dyslexic brain. Um, so, I thought I'd play some extracts of the composition, um, and I've pasted together some tiny, tiny extracts to give you a wee taste, um, but it's, it's my bad DJing, so it really just le leaps. I'll maybe explain as we go along. So here we move between being waves and red-throated diver. And now we're, we're jumping straight into movement two, into the colonies on the cliffs. Leech is storm petrol. Kitty wake. These are the leech is storm petrols, they're kind of courting. some birds um, arriving on the cliffs. I'm not sure which species they are. I'm not quite sure where we're going next. Oh, we're still in movement two. Um, and now this is, uh, um, imagine you're walking on the cliffs of St Kilda and uh, you are um, moving between different social groups of different species. to flocking of various gull species. With 
group of swans just landing. But now we're back to the goals. So it's really bad DJing tonight, isn't it? <laughs> it's basically I'm trying to give snippets from an hour long piece. That's not us. <laughs> that is Fuka Swans. the final movement, which is the Manx Shear Water. So as the music ebbs and flows, my intention was to recall the ecotones where species meet and the interrelationship between bird and human, whose lineage stretches back to early hunter-gatherer peoples, for whom bird calls and animal cries had magico-religious symbolism, and to tune in to a sonic continuum that reaches into the more-than-human world. Okay, thank you.